Good morning, everybody. I'm Deborah Tomlinson, and I'm sitting here with Robert Moynihan, the founder and editor of Inside the Vatican, and our dear friend, Father Murr, who is joining us again for this edition of 30 Years, The Untold Stories. Father Murr and Bob, I give it to the two of you to, to continue the, the conversations that we have had on this platform. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Well, we are returning again to the heart of the church. To 1978, which was so-called year of three popes, Paul VI, who died on August 6th, John Paul I, who died on September 28th, and John Paul II, who was elected in October 1978 and remained pope until 2005. These three popes at the heart of the church are our subject today. And we're looking in particular at the pontificate of John Paul I, famous because he was the first pope ever to take two names. And also he was so far the last Italian born pope. We've had since him a Polish pope, Karol Wojtyla, John Paul II, a German pope, Joseph Ratzinger, Benedict XVI, and an Argentine Pope, Pope Francis. Father Murr, we, Greetings, are, sir. <laughs> we are so pleased to continue this conversation. And the first thing people have been asking me in emails is how do they keep hope in the midst of these intrigues and the difficulty they have in being completely confident of the of the leadership and of the direction of the church, given all of these questions? That's a very good question. You want my response to it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, without, without intending to offend anyone, I would simply say it's time to grow up. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by that? I mean, it's time to mature in our faith. A lot of us, I can speak from, from my own experience for years, but I, but I also speak for a lot of people I know uh, live, living in and well today. We're living with a faith that's, that's almost uh, from kindergarten, uh, uh, f uh, from catechism days, from, uh, from first communion days. It's time to grow up. When we received the, the sacrament of confirmation, it was a sacrament of, of, of maturing, that we've matured, that we're adults, that we take our place in the church as adults. Um, it's time to live that. And I, I, I think we have to look, we have to be reasonable and look at, at problems. There are problems in the church. There are problems in our families. I, we were just talking about this, you and I, before, the, before we, we came on the air. I, I don't know about your family, Bob, but my family has had a, a multitude of problems. Uh, I won't even get into them, but I mean, serious, serious stuff. Uh, we lived through it. Each one of us had to work things out for himself. We matured and we look at life a little bit differently, but we haven't given up family. We haven't given up our, our country, our home. Our, our We don't abandon everything because we've got problems mm -hmm. and we can't abandon the church either. The church is our real family. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, when we get to heaven, God willing, everybody who's listening to this will be among the, those there, uh, beginning with me. I, I hope to be there. That'll be the biggest surprise, right? Fulton J. Remember Fulton J. Sheen said there are three surprises waiting for us in heaven? You remember those surprises, I, Bob? I he do said, not. There are three great surprises that'll, 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 uh, you'll be confronted with in heaven. So the first thing is you're not going to see some people you thought you would see. The second thing is you're going to see some people you thought you wouldn't see. Hmm. And the third and greatest surprise is that you yourself will be there. <laughs> so, so what I'm saying is what I'm trying to say is heaven is our home. Our family is the church. We don't abandon either one. We, we continue being part of it. We try to look for solutions and answers and, and, uh, and grow up. That's what I'm saying. It's time to grow up. It's time to look at things the way they are. 
rather than, than, than being uh, naive. Uh, I think it's time for people to mature in their faith and look at real problems and, and real situations. For years, what we said, probably for centuries, we said to our priests and to our bishops and to our popes, here are the problems, you take care of the problems. Well, they're not doing a great job at that. And all the responsibility is not theirs. Great part of the responsibility is ours. It belongs to us. All right. So you can't just say, well, why doesn't the Pope do this? Why doesn't the Bishop do that? Why don't you do something? Oh, right. right? I mean, this is, you know, it's, it's time to grow up. That's all. And uh, I think also something, you know, before we get into what we're talking about, there have been a lot of, uh, I've been hit all on, on all sides with problems with Pope Francis. The people are having problems with Pope Francis. He said this, he said that. He's, okay, do you know the real answer? Mm. You know, do you know what the truth is? Mm. Live the truth. Don't worry about him. You know what the truth is. We've, we've got a great, I think, a great text with the Catechism of the Catholic Church that was approved in 1983. took 25 years to put it together. I think it's there. Oh, Father Mayor. Um. Well, it seems like um, something has happened. It's coming from his end, I believe. So um, he has lost internet for a moment, and he still may not realize it. Um, um, I'm going to send him a note right now. All right. Well, so Bob, do you want to comment a little bit about what Father Murr was saying? And, and sure. I think that we opened with that because we had so many comments and emails that came into our office about that people are really enjoying these shows; they're enjoying the topics. Um, and the conversation and how it's lively and organic, um, yet it's difficult to have hope in there. Well, our concern in having these live streaming um, videos and, and having the 30 years, the untold stories is we didn't want to feed the beast in people, meaning that this desire to find out like really what is going on, what is the truth, but we wanted to hopefully sprinkle some things to give people a new understanding. And his father just so brilliantly said, it's a family that has problems and we all have problems in our family. And we just need to not look at the church as being this idyllic family. Well, I think it's uh, precisely true that we should grow up hard for all of us. I think that, as my father used to say, the heart, oh, Father Murr. Here I am. I've you been know, hearing you. I've been hearing you, but I disappear frequently. I don't know. Well, I, I'm, I'm maybe, not moving. I'm here. Maybe we had some type of attack and <laughs> someone is interrupting your feed. I think you lost internet for a moment and then uh, you've come back now. You, you froze, Father. And so I froze. You That's froze. not like me. That's not no. like it at all. <laughs> so I removed you um, while everything was able to catch up. So I'll let the okay. two of you continue. All right. All right. Well, I, I will just summarize on this point. People are worried and a little bit concerned. Some are losing hope. Some have left the church. Um, my, my grandmother, my father's mother, once said to me, Bob, Bobby, it's all about the milk of human kindness. And, uh, well, we have a question. Father Murr was going to comment on the orthodoxy of the catechism, which was, which was uh, 1992, 93, not 82, 83. You're thinking of the code of canon law. Oh, what? Well, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah, I've got the dates mixed up. All right. And you were going to comment on its orthodoxy. Yeah, on, on, the, on the catechism. I thought it, yeah. I thought it was, I, I thought for the most part, for the most part, there are a couple things that I would take issue with. I, let me just put it this way. Since the council, <laughs> I'm really tired of vague. I'm, I'm tired of vague. I, I like, I like uh, I'm a, a, a meat, potato, and sometimes gravy man. 
I yeah. like I like substance. And when I hear things that that are not precise or are sort of open ended, uh, I, I what I love what I, it, you've got to laugh at this, Bob. You must have you must have found this out when you were reading Canon Law, the new code of Canon Law. It says this is the law. <laughs> Unless it's otherwise. <laughs> well, right. I, I, I mean, if we're really legalistic, then we are missing what uh, what Jesus was telling us. He said, the oh, of Lord, course, of course. That, that, that's not what I'm saying. I, I don't want to become a Pharisee. I'm simply saying you've got laws. Exactly. <laughs> I, I've never run into a speed. I've, I've, I've been caught speeding a couple of times and, and, and uh, at least once gotten a ticket, right? Maybe twice. Talked myself out of two or three others. But uh, I never remember that, you know, the law says 35 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour. It doesn't say unless. <laughs> mm. I, I like to know what is. When you know what is, you can deal with it. You can, everything has parameters, more or less. I understand that. Okay. But I, but I, but I don't think I don't like things open ended, and I think a lot of people are having trouble with things being open ended. They're not clear. Hmm. We and we have we have today a pontificate, which is uh, to a lot of people, myself included. I'm going to throw myself in there too. It's it's just on, a lot of things are unclear, and uh, uh, I, people want direction. What I'm saying is, for the time being, there isn't that. Okay, for the time being, there isn't that. Mm -hmm. However, the answer is there. Yeah, there's no need for despair. The answer is there. The answer is in your Catholic faith that you learned. You have a catechism by the Catholic Church. It's quite, it's quite clear. It's clear enough. And you have, the, you have Thomas Aquinas. You have the great saints and great theologians. And my gosh, you've got the Internet. Well, start taking responsibility and finding out the answers, right? That's all I'm saying. It's time to mature. It's time to mature in the faith. And people who leave who leave the church because, I don't know, for whatever, whatever reason, I don't know what, if they do that also in their lives. My gosh, Robert, just in my own family, we've had everything. We've had everything. Yeah. From murder to, 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 to crime to this, everything. You deal with it. You deal with it and and you get on, but you don't just say, okay, I'm no longer a part of the family. I'm just, that's it. That's not the that's not the answer. That's not the answer. Anyway, enough of my sermon on that. No, I appreciate it. I think the central word that comes to my mind is redemption and redeemer, which is also savior. If we're all in the midst of a of a crisis, and everyone is. Uh, sinning and the church is made up of men and women who do commit sins um we have to seek higher assistance we have to return in prayer and in the liturgy to the life of christ himself his passion his his uh, resurrection and we do that even in the rosary, the rosary has the sorrow, has the sorrow of the crowning of thorns, the scourging, the crucifixion, the agony in the garden. And then it has the joy of Jesus coming into the world, Christmas, the visitation. And then it has uh, the glorious mysteries. The, 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 catech the, the Bible, the, the New Testament speaks both of these joys and sorrows. And even Vatican II, which speaks of the joys and sorrows of all men, which the church wishes to understand and to share, which I always find that uh, the beginning point of some of our confusions comes from the Vatican Council, which I resolve, I think, by saying it's not a dogmatic council pastoral council and therefore everything that's come since can be readjusted and they've been trying to readjust it now for more than 50 years but I don't think you can dogmatize the second Vatican council and I think some people have tried to do that because they wished to take away the transcendent and open up uh, the church to a kind of humanist 
imminence, and that's the key dogma for them. But it isn't the key dogma of the Second Vatican Council. And we are now, uh, well, let's get back to our main question, though, as we're looking at all of these events from the Second Vatican Council till today, 1965 until 2023, we could interpret almost all of them as a struggle over how to appropriate the insights of the council that the church wants to preach the gospel to all humankind and the distortions of that insight that the church must, must um, no longer have a content in its teaching, but simply be a uh, kind of social uh, support for people where they are. And I think in that, they're not giving the message of the redemption, the message that in this fallen world, there can be redemption. In these fallen families, there can be redemption. And in the church, there can be healing. And I think that's the message I take from what we've said these few moments here. Hello? So, Heather, I don't know. I think we've perhaps lost you again. Yes, I think so. I think so, Bob. So I think let's get to the to the first point that I think you and Father Murr wanted to cover, and that was to <clears throat> the last Italian Pope and the transfer from the Italian Popes to the global world. Well, I do think that what we're seeing in 1978 uh, and I think we can follow it through to today with the globalists today, is the continuing and definitive globalizing of the Roman Catholic Church as it emerges from Eurocentric church and as it emerges from an it Italo-centric church focused on Rome and on Italy. And I think this is a great um, question because I think Italy was a great place for the church to be based in all these centuries with the Italian qualities of, uh, of brilliance and gentleness and friendliness and uh, focus on family. And yet um, the church wishes to be fully global and to reach out to Asia and to Latin America and to Africa. And starting in the 20th century, it started to bring people from each of these areas into Rome, into the central government of the church. And finally in 1978, it brings John Paul II, following the death of John Paul I in, as Pope from Poland, and then he plays a pivotal role in that tremendous confrontation with the Soviet Union. So do you think we're going to get Father Murr back? I'm not quite sure. I'm trying to get him back right now. He might have uh, some internet problems where he is. Well, I do feel that this um, short pontificate, the struggles over it, and then the struggle after it to elect a next pope, and all of the attempts of the leadership of the church to remain faithful to tradition or to tailor that tradition in such a way as to be attractive and effective to the whole world is the, is the double helix, the genetic code of these decades. We both are remaining faithful we published the Catechism in the early 1990s under John Paul II. Benedict XVI tried to reconcile this experiment with the new order of the Mass, the new liturgy, and the old liturgy. Greetings. Ah, it's great to have you back. Yeah, fear not, it is I. <laughs> yes. We, lo right. we, lost, we lost internet uh, uh, connection on, on my part. I'm sorry for that. I just ran out. No, no problem. So we, Bob was just going over the first point that, that the two of you wanted to make. He just finished with that, the transfer from the Italian Pope to the global world. And that was a, that was a big was, deal. That was a big deal. 
Yeah. yeah. And uh, you were there at the time. So let's focus in. You're an eyewitness to history. And let's look at that transition, the year of the three popes. And then your particular point of view on what the struggle was. Who were the characters? We've talked about it already. We know Paul VI had passed away. We, we know that in some ways he liked Benelli, but maybe, and Benelli was, uh, who had been in the Vatican for many years, had been moved to Florence just before Paul VI died. And some people thought Benelli would be elected pope. And then uh, Cardinal Siri from Genoa was again a popular candidate. Uh, he was, there's a book about him called Il Papa Non Eletto by Benny Lai, who was a journalist in Italy, very close to Cardinal Siri, talked to him all the time. Cardinal Siri died in 1989, but Benny Lai named the book The Pope Who Was Not Elected because he received many votes in 1958 when John the 23rd was elected. He received mm -hmm. many votes in 1963 when Paul the sixth was elected. He mm -hmm. received many votes in 1978 in August when John Paul the first was elected. And finally, he also received many votes in October, 1978 when John Paul the second was elected. So we have Benelli, we have Siri, we have other candidates were mentioned, but emerging from the conclave is Albino Luciani, Luciani, who was the patriarch of Venice. And he was 67 years old. He was elected on the second day of the conclave. And he was known as the smiling Pope. And 33 days after his election on at the end of August, 1978, he suddenly died in his sleep on September 28th, 1978. And we then in October chose John Paul II. John Paul took the name after John Paul I, John Paul II. So let's look at Luciani and his pontificate. And you had something to do with that because you were a friend of Cardinal Gagnon. Can you tell us what happened? Well, I, I think to understand that, uh, and we've kind of been over this before, so if I'm repeating, stop me, all right? But um, since Gagnon was, had, was commissioned by Paul VI to do the investigation on the Roman Curia, and it took three years, uh, he gave the, the, the documentation to Paul VI, and Paul VI rejected it. We got that last time. Uh, Paul VI died. There's the election to come up of a new Pope. And it's true Luciani was elected, but it's also true that Luciani was Cardinal Benelli's candidate. When Benelli saw in the conclave that it was not going, that Siri was not going to budge. He was not going to compromise in, in, in any shape or, or manner. And he also saw that Baggio was steadily gaining votes. Right. Benelli, I, Benelli, I, I, Benelli said, Benelli said, no, 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 no. And he proposed Luciani as a, as a candidate, not just a neutral candidate. It's not like, it's not like a compromised neutral candidate. Luciani was a very pious and very good man. And he was accepted by, by the majority easily because he had a good reputation and he was a, he was a good man. He was Benelli's candidate. And Luciani asked Benelli, uh, right after the election, to be his Secretary of State. Mm. So this is, and this is, I think, if, if I can just step back a little bit, I use this comparison. It's very important for anybody in power, whether it be religious power, whether it be political power, to surround yourself with people you know, people of your confidence and people who agree with you as far as the direction that you're going to take, if you're the leader in this. The president of the United States is a leader, the president of France is a leader, the Pope is a leader. So you've gotta be surrounded by people that you trust. Luciani did something that was, uh, I would, this, this is my critique of it, was not wise. 
Mm -hmm. wanted Benelli to be his secretary of state. But instead of having Benelli be his secretary of state from day one, he confirmed everyone in the Roman Curia in his old place. Now, let me let me just say this for your viewers, for our viewers, that when a pope dies, it is up to every head of every office in the Vatican to present his resignation. So that the new pope has complete freedom to name his people because you you want to. Can you imagine, for example, a Democrat wins the election and he's stuck with a Republican uh, with a Republican cabinet? Well, it's (laughs) It's not going to work. (laughs) <laughs> or it could, it could be vice versa. And we, sometimes yes. We call that the deep state. Yes, yes. Well, those are the people who never go away. <laughs> they just get, they're just they kind of always there, right? We so have that in the church, too. We have that in the church, and okay, you know so, that. You know? So really, for, your, for our audience, you would say there is a deep church. Uh, I'm, I'm, absolutely. And there are people, there are, I, I'll bet you, if you would look right now, there are people, there are career ecclesiastics people their career is is in the vatican going up step by step by step by step by step this is this is what it's all about so they're there for decades there are some people there today who are still as a matter of fact i'm not going to mention his name he's a good he was a good priest he just died recently but he was there from from the time of paul the sixth uh uh from, from paul the sixth from uh John the 23rd, Paul the 6th, John Paul 1, John Paul 2, Benedict, <laughs> he just recently died. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's been all the way through. Now, this was a good man. I happen to know him, and he was a very good man and, and a very faithful priest and, 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 and of a good, a good line of thought. But there are, there are people there who don't have the best of intentions. They're out for themselves. Why, why is this? Because they're human. This is the human factor. We deal with it in the church. We deal with it again in our families. We deal with it everywhere. It's called the effects of original sin. <laughs> this is what we're dealing with, right? Okay, so you've got the, this, this. This is what's happening. Uh, John Paul I is elected. John Paul I, the new pope, confirms everyone in his place. So all of the heads of the congregations in the Vatican are all safe. They're going to stay there. Privately, he talks with Benelli and asks Benelli to be his secretary of state. And how do you know that? I know that because because I know it from Gagnon, uh, who was in contact with Benelli and right. and with Marini and with Marini, who was Benelli's who was Benelli's uh, one of his right hand men in the secretariat of state. Okay, the things you're telling us now are not recorded in most of the histories. No, that, <laughs> you're that, sure they aren't. Yeah. That Luciani was the candidate of Benelli after he saw that Siri, and particularly that Baggio was beginning to receive votes. Yes. And that does, that does, uh, that is had, so- Bob, let me just tell you this. You had, there was one Cardinal and I, again, I know this. I know this uh, from from good source, who said that his greatest fear in life, the reason he had nightmares, was because with the upcoming election of a new pope, he had nightmares about having to kiss the the papal ring, the fisherman's ring, on the hand of Sebastian Baggio, who would be the first Freemason pope. <laughs> right. This is, this is where we were right now. And there were a lot of people very aware of this. And Benelli was one of them. Benelli took his own votes. Benelli got quite a few votes. He took his own votes and gave them to Luciani. And that was his candidate. Luciani asked Benelli a few days later to be his secretary of state. Benelli agreed. Also, Benelli said, but there's one, one condition. Yeah. You have to get rid of Cardinal Baggio immediately from the Congregation of Bishops. All right? Yeah. Luciani was a, a very good man, a timid man, not a strong man. Okay? He, he, he just, he wasn't that strong. He didn't have a strong character. He was rather shy, as a matter of fact. He asked Benelli, 
you take care of it with, as Secretary of State. And Benelli said, no, you have to take care of it. That's why he had the documents of, of Gagnon to show who, who Baggio was. He said, take care of it. Mm -hmm. Well, the Pope, he said, it's good for your own pontificate. You're defining your own pontificate by beginning this way. You have to begin this way. That, that's Benelli. Benelli was a strong man. Okay. It was no nonsense. And he wanted, he wanted the Pope also to take a stand and to define his pontificate right from the beginning. Okay, so John Paul the first. John, John Paul the first then calls in, calls, makes a telephone call to Baggio. Okay. And he invites him to have a talk. Baggio said he was busy. How about this afternoon? Still busy, Your Holiness. Okay, Robert, can you imagine getting a call from the Pope and, and you tell the Pope, no, I'm sorry, I'm busy? Mm. I mean, you would cancel anything but your, your own mother's funeral, I suppose, right? To be yeah. there. So, but, so the so, question... And, and, and then, then, then the, the new Pope said to him, all right, this evening. Now, what are you going to tell me? You're, you're busy this evening too? This evening, that would be social. You're having dinner with somebody. You can cancel that. He agreed. And he went to the Vatican. This is in my book. He went to the Vatican. He spoke with the Pope at about 8 o'clock in the evening. They had a meeting in which it was proposed, and this was Benelli's proposal, and the Pope agreed to it. Get Baggio out of the congregation for bishops and give him Venice. Name okay. him to Venice. Why okay. Venice? Because it was free. It belonged to Luciani. It belonged to the Pope, who the actual Pope at the same time. He had auxiliary bishops that he that he trusted. And he had secretaries and people in place already in Venice who were very loyal Catholics. They could keep an eye on this man. Okay. This is the point that you are making. This we might call the Murr thesis. And I'm fascinated by it. And what it now reminds me of is that Luciani in some way was considering for weeks how to get Sebastiano Baggio out of the Vatican, get him someplace that he could accept, but where he would still be surrounded and couldn't do anything effective. And that was the Venice solution. And yet what then happened? All right, just, just back up for a second, Bob. Look at this. You understand diplomacy, and you understand Vatican diplomacy, and you understand also that the, the oldest school of diplomacy in the world is the Vatican school of diplomacy, all right? right. They've perfected diplomacy like you can't believe. They don't throw someone out. They don't throw a diplomat out. You promote... You promote to remove. You right. give a man a promotion, all right? And he's out of his office, right? This is what they were, excuse me, this is what we were talking about with, with uh, Bugnini, with the liturgy. They, what did they do when they found out that he was a Freemason and everything else and all the chaos that was reigning because of him? They promoted him. They promoted him as Nuncio to Iran. Good. There he is, way over there. Right? Yeah. The same thing with Baggio. So the Pope invited him up to talk finally to get up and the and you can believe believe me that the pope pope had to had to get up his his own nerve to do this because i'm telling you he was just not a strong man in that sense strong mm -hmm. in the faith but he was you know go along get along that kind of thing Baggio arrived and we have a, we have a discrepancy not a discrepancy but we have a problem don't we yeah uh, with, and you want to mention what that problem was, or should I mention this first? All right. uh, Baggio well, arrives at, at eight, eight o'clock approximately yeah. at the Pope's private study in the Apostolic Palace. Yeah. He goes in, the Pope talks to him. What they said exactly, nobody knows because only the two of them were there. However, the two of them were there and they had this talk. Baggio raised his voice. And when I say he raised his voice, uh, I talk about shouting. And there were Swiss guards 
who were standing right outside of the door who verified that shouting. Evidently, evidently, again, I wasn't there, but evidently the Pope proposed that he leave the Vatican and he go to Venice. Baggio refused. Mm-hmm. He left in anger. He left slamming a door behind him after the meeting had, had, had finished. The Pope had a very bad heart. You don't do that kind of a thing to somebody with a bad heart. Mm-hmm. I'm, sure, I'm sure no Pope and no president is really comfortable with being yelled at. Mm. Right? And if you were the, the Pope of Rome, you're not yelled at by a cardinal. You're not yelled at by a, by a, by a churchman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this doesn't happen. And when it does happen, it's, it's dramatic. Well, this poor man suffered a heart attack two or three hours later mm-hmm. and died. Uh, now, we just, let me just make a parenthesis, a quick one. We're not talking about he was poisoned, uh, he was strangled, he was, no, 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 none of that. I, I asked Cardinal Gagnon the next day, we were, we were walking, we, Gagnon, Marini and I were together when we got this news and we took a, a walk that following Sunday out. This was, do, do you remember Robert, this was the news in Rome. If you went on a bus, if you went into a cafe for a coffee, everyone was talking about the Pope being poisoned. Yeah. All right. No, it had the Vatican killed him. And this was the talk of everywhere. Well, it wasn't that. But anyway, uh, the three of us, Marini, Gagnon and I went for a a little bit of a walk over by right across the street from uh, from uh, the hospital. The 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 Austrian German nuns have Salvatore Mundi Hospital. Salvatore Mundi. Yeah, it's a beautiful it's a beautiful park. We went in Chiara, I think it is. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We went walking in there, and I, 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 I asked Gagnon point blank. I said, "Do you think? Do you think the Pope was murdered?" Now I'm what am I? Twenty seven years old, twenty eight. He said, "I know what you're asking." <laughs> he said, "But I'm just going to answer this way. There are many ways of killing a man." <laughs> Oh man! All right, that's that's all. That's all I'm going to say. There are many ways of killing a man. All right, that's it. Baggio, according to me, this is my thesis, but it's also Benelli's thesis, Gagnon's thesis. Everybody was in agreement with it. Who knew about it? He suffered a heart attack because of that shouting, because okay. of, the, of the rejection of what he was doing. All right. That's all right. What we're doing. Now, so, now we have some problems. Go right ahead. I love problems. <laughs> All right. I've got a book here uh, called The September Pope, The Final Days of John Paul II. And the author is Stefania Falasca, with a foreword by Cardinal Pietro Parolin, who's the Secretary of State today. Mm-hmm. And some people think could be elected the next pope after Francis. So this book is about the final days of John Paul I. And inside this book, she goes day by day and she talks about the cause of death. And she's she's actually arguing and, and she's quite a qualified researcher. And I know her, I know Stefania. And she's been working with the Congregation for the Causes of Saints on a positio for John Paul I Mm -hmm. to have him declared blessed and perhaps canonized because he was a good man. But in this book, there is no mention of, and, and she tries to show each day who he met with. And of course, On September 5th, John Paul I met with Nicodem, who came from Leningrad, Russia. He was a Russian metropolitan and the foreign, sort of the foreign Mm -hmm. minister of the Russian Orthodox Church, very interested in Catholicism. And even some people later said, was thinking 
of converting to Catholicism. And by the way, Nicodemus was the patron of the present patriarch, Kirill, who's the famous patriarch now in Russia, who's thought to be the chief support of Putin. So Nicodemus, in his 40s, on September 5th, came to John Paul I, starts to speak to him, falls into his arms and has a heart attack. Mm -hmm. And there were rumors at the time that he had been poisoned by the coffee that he drank. This is why when you yes. said when you said that Rome was a buzz on the morning of September 29th with rumors that John Paul I had been poisoned, it's not a surprise. The Romans will rumor that. And they had that memory that three weeks before, mm -hmm. one of the leaders of the Russian Orthodox Church out of the Soviet Union had come to Rome and had, had collapsed in a heart attack right in the arms of John Paul I. An amazing story. Mm -hmm. And it's still a mystery. John Paul I later said that Nicodem had wished to whisper some words to him before he died. This is true. He said, he confessed to me. And he said amazing things. This, no one has ever confirmed or gotten into what it was that Nicodemus said. But John Paul said, John Paul I said in some private communication, he said amazing, no, I think he said this actually to some public group that he spoke to. He said he said amazing things to me about the church and about his faith. And about yes. Yeah. You remember that? So, yes, I do. So, Stefania, in this book, which just came out in English, it was done, I think, in 2017 in Italian, and it came out in 2021 in English. She doesn't report that Baggio came to see John Paul I on the night of September 28th. What she says instead is that he called Cardinal Colombo up in Milan, who was his assistant trying to find a way to choose the next patriarch for Venice. So what we know for sure, at least we think we know for sure, is that Paul, John Paul I was focused on who could go to Venice. That was a question that re in this book, he, 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 he actually says, he's quoted, John Paul I in this book is quoted as meeting with Baggio earlier in the month and saying to him, would you like to go to Venice? That's quoted in this book. Because Baggio was trying to get some, uh, some other candidate that uh, he wanted to go to Venice because Baggio was, as you point out, rightly, in charge of all the bishops, the appointment of all the bishops in the Catholic world. And the Bishop of Venice was now empty and one of the most important in Italy. And there was no doubt a struggle over who to put in Venice to replace John Paul I, a matter of great importance to him. Still, this book does not report a meeting on the evening of September 28th Therefore, it doesn't report a fight with Sebastiano Baggio. Now, now, just a moment. So now, since it's not reported, it didn't happen? Is that what you're saying? No. No. You realize I'm having you, I am having you talk yes. on this program of the untold <laughs> stories because I'm persuaded, I'm persuaded that we, that something that we don't know and that Stefania couldn't know either, because I'm sure she did an excellent job. But as you and I both know, and I'm really basing this on something that Archbishop Paul Casimir Marchinkus told me many years ago. And he said, come to me before I die, and I will tell you stories that will, <laughs> cur that will curl your hair. Yep. Now, that is a fact. Yeah. I, I, I then tried to go see him before the end of his life. He finally agreed to see me in Sun City, Arizona in retirement in 2006, in February. And I called him and he said, yes, Bob, now I'm willing to talk. Come on out. 
and three days later, just before my flight, he died. You know, Bob, between the two of us, people better be careful. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, what seems we, like everybody will get close to dies. <laughs> well, we all have to die, Father. I, yes, I know. And as I'm a little older now, I guess I decided to start this program because um, the truth shall set us free. Now, the truth in this case, I, I don't yet know. And um, you even say it's your thesis because you don't know that this heart attack is what killed him. I wouldn't even exclude myself that there was something else. That's how that's how open-minded I am about what happened because nothing in the Vatican on certain occasions makes sense. And I have to add in not even the resignation of Pope Benedict XVI, which broke my heart. Broke all of our hearts. And now some of the decisions taken by Pope Francis, our present Holy Father. And I've met him. I wrote a book about him. And uh, this might be the moment. Uh, we'll come back to this Baggio meeting, but I have to say that I think there is a factor, which I call the Esther factor, that influences the thinking and the decisions of Pope Francis. And Esther was a woman from Paraguay who came to Buenos Aires because she was a leftist, a women's rights advocate, and the Paraguayan military government was going to arrest her. So she came to Buenos Aires and she met Jorge Begorlio when he was 18 years old and she was about 38. She was married, she had a daughter, and she worked in a chemistry or chemical laboratory. And they became close friends. Later in testimony about her, Jorge Mario Bergoglio said that she was a wonderful, profound, loving woman and a deep friend. However, she was arrested in the 1970s. They became friends in the 1950s. This lady, Esther, was arrested by the military government in Argentina. And all indications are, I'm not sure we could say it's absolutely proven, but she was all indications from various articles I've read and testimony that I've weighed. She was arrested, tortured, and put in an airplane, carried out over the Atlantic Ocean, and dropped from 20,000 feet until she died and her body was torn apart in the water. And then she washed up on the shore. But genetic DNA testing finally revealed who she was. And her daughter came to Jorge Mario Bergoglio and asked that she be buried in a churchyard. And he was deeply moved to hear of her death. And he agreed for her burial. She was a woman who fought for the rights of women. She fought for the mothers of the Palazzo Mayor. And I have a thesis that something inside of this Pope made a commitment not to go along with military regimes and not to go along with military oppression. And that some of the decisions he take, which seem very humanistic and very uh, untraditional, have to do with this personal friendship that he had with this woman who was arrested and executed. Mm -hmm. Hello? Yes. Yes. Uh, I don't know what to tell you. Well, I, I just think that when we let me, look at... Let me just ask a question. Let me just ask a question. Now here you're, you're talking to a modern day Pharisee, all right? A man who likes the law. Was the woman Catholic? I don't believe she was a believer or a practicing Catholic. She may have been born Catholic because she was Latin American. Oh, well, then the, she was baptized, I, I assume. Then she, mm -hmm. had, she had a right to a funeral mass and to Catholic burial. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I don't know the answer to these questions. But I, what I'm saying is, if I have been told, in all honesty, by an important and controversial Vatican Monsignor, Monsignor Mar Marcinkus, 
that some things would curl my hair. I must believe that it involves duplicity, deception, trickery, and cruelty, perhaps murder, and all of this because the church is the place in the world where the message of God is proclaimed, the throne in this world of Jesus Christ's mystical yes. body. Therefore, inevitably, there will be conflict and struggle to control it, to condition it, to mislead it. This is what, this is what I take from the phrase that he spoke to me. Therefore, as I study your thesis, I am not impeded by the fact that there's not an official registry because many things happen that are not officially recorded. Well, first, of all, first of all, yes, there, there's that. There's that, of course. But also, this is a meeting at night. This is not on the agenda. Hmm. This is not on, the, on, the, on the, uh, the business day agenda, who's coming, who's going. This is an evening meeting outside of anybody's schedule because it was that pressing a matter. Now, that she didn't report this, or maybe she, I'm, I'm sure she doesn't know about it. Doesn't matter because not everyone in the world knew about it. Doesn't mean that it didn't happen because in fact it did happen. It did happen. And also a, a curious thing, years later, uh, I, was, I, I was, I remembered something that I had read there was only one place that mentioned that meeting with Abajo with the Pope at night. Uh huh. Where would that be? That would be Time Magazine. You ever heard of Time Magazine? Yeah, of course. Kind of. It, kind of it, it used to be good. It used to be good. Time Magazine reported that meeting. Uh, Deborah. Okay, that's the issue of Time Magazine that was put out after this sudden, mysterious unexpected death on September 28th, 1978. Now we have the cover, the church in shock, the red shoes. That's a photo of Pope Luciani, John Paul I. And what does the article say, Deb? Well, what does the article say? The September Pope, John Paul I's sudden death stuns and saddens the Christian world. Okay, and what does it say here in the final column? After, okay, fullness of life in the kingdom of heaven, after a spare lunch, this is the 28th of September. After a spare lunch? And afternoon siesta, John Paul returned to his desk. Milan's Giovanni Cardinal Colombo, who talked to him by phone, recalled that he sounded, quote, full of serenity and hope, unquote. He, that is John Paul I, summoned Sebastiano Cardinal Baggio, head of the Congregation for Bishops and a papabile, papal possibility, going into the last conclave to discuss pressing business. This is exactly what you have been saying, Monsignor Murr. Thank you. At 7.30 in the evening, the Pope, John Paul I, had his usual daily meeting with Vatican Secretary of State Jean Viot, 72. And I must say that I don't find this meeting in Stefania's book either. So it's the second thing on the 28th that's not adding up. I, why would Time Magazine write this? Possi they could possibly have made some mistake, but it's here in black and white. If you, this this journalist, of course. First of all, first of all, it wasn't a mistake. I'm telling you, it's true that, that this is exact. That's what happened. Baggio had an evening me, uh, meeting with the Pope. He was called to it. Okay. I, I know that. I know that. We know we know it from Gagnon. I know it from Marini. I know it from Zanoni. Uh, Benelli was in contact with with all of these people, especially with Gagnon, and with the Pope. Uh, no, okay. I, that it was missed. On her part, uh, that's fine. She missed it. Right. But it, 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 that's not saying it didn't happen because it did. That's all okay. I'm saying. I understand. I'm sure that historians will often say if it's not documented, it's not part of history. But that's a fallacy, of course. 
some of the key things in history have no documentation. That's why people will sometimes meet and say, let's shake hands on this, let's speak about it, but let's not put it into a text message or an email, you know, or a, or a written agreement. Correct? Isn't, isn't that the way a lot of times people act? Uh, I knew a lot of businessmen and a lot of Wall Street people in New York, and that's exactly how they act. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want this down in writing. Uh, we'll meet, and that's, a, that's it. However, what I'm saying is the meeting did happen. I know it happened before this. I remember also reading it in Time magazine. And when I was thinking, how do I prove this? I mean, I can't prove How can I prove it? I can't. You either believe it or you don't believe it, but it did happen. And then I said, just a minute, just a minute. I did read it. There was a verification of it. It was Time magazine. And I remember, remember uh, right in Piazza Pio del Dicesimo, right outside of St. Peter's Square, the, the, yeah. the, the, the yeah. square right there used to be a kiosk there. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's still there. Right in front of Mrs. Bot Bot uh, Bocconcelli's uh, religious goods store. And I would always buy Time magazine. It came out on, on Tuesday. Time magazine came out on Tuesday afternoon. I bought it there because it had the article in the Pope. And I remember that it verified exactly what was what was told to me uh, the, the day after the Pope died, the, the day the Pope died, the, the same day that night. All right. So on the one hand, that's, that's what I'm telling you. That's that's what that is what happened. Uh, OK, so I first would say I still, therefore, leave open the precise cause of death. Because there was never an autopsy. Now, but I would say that the evidence that's been published at times is insufficient that it is at times actually inaccurate and mistaken. And this book as well, this book proves, it proves that some things were lies. This book, do you yes. remember that the next morning, yes. the Vatican announced that the Pope's secretary, an Irishman named Monsignor yeah. McGee, John McGee, right. had gone in and found the Pope holding the imitation of Christ That's and was right. reading it in his bed. Okay, now this book says that was a lie that they told intentionally because they didn't want to say that a nun had gone into his room. <laughs> Incredible. Incredible. So, so this, this book proves that the Vatican officially could put out something untrue and leave it out for a long time and not correct it. So therefore, there's a question that must arise that any journalist must have. When the Vatican puts out a statement, they must say, is it true? <laughs> yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But this is now, I'm gonna probably end this with, we can go a little longer, but this is sister, in this book, there's the testimony for this process of the beatification and canonization. It's an interview with the eyewitness, Sister Margarita Marin, Marin, who was one of the four sisters there that night. She saw mm -hmm. John Paul I go into his bedroom around nine o'clock at night, and he turns and he kind of says good night, and he smiles. That's the last smile, the last time she saw him alive. So this is what she says. The usual practice was the Holy Father got up early in the morning around 5 a.m. He started the day by dedicating a lot of time to personal prayer. At about 5.30 a.m., he entered the chapel and stayed there for more than an hour. He remained absorbed in prayer. This is his usual practice. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to get to the last day. In the morning... Wait a minute. Okay, the last morning he got up as usual. On the morning of the 28th, the day he died, mm -hmm. he went into the chapel to pray at the usual time and he celebrated Mass with us at 7. He normally had breakfast and then stopped for a while to read the mm -hmm. meeting. Then around 9 o'clock, he went downstairs for his morning audiences. Around noon, 
He came back upstairs to the apartments, but I remember that he came into the kitchen as he often did, asking us for a coffee. Sister, do you have any coffee? Can you make me a coffee? Noon time on the day that he died. He sat down to wait, took the coffee and went to his study. He then had lunch with his secretary. Later, he retired for his usual short afternoon rest. I don't remember exactly when he went back to his rooms. Okay, so she doesn't know. But he stayed home that whole afternoon. Mm -hmm. He never moved from the apartments. There's time there for people to visit him. He, ne he received no one because he told us he was drafting a document for the bishops. But she doesn't know that he received no one. She doesn't know that. He just told the, them. I remember it well. Uh, however, I remember it well because that afternoon I was ironing in the wardrobe room with the door open and I could see him going back and forth. He was walking around the apartment with papers in his hand that he was reading every now and then and he would stop to make a few notes and then he would start walking again while reading. And as he walked, he would pass by where I was standing. I remember that seeing me ironing, he said to me, sister, I make you work so hard but you don't need to iron that shirt so well because it's hot. I sweat and you have to change them often. Just iron the collar and the cuffs. You can't see the rest, you know. He told me this in his Venetian dialect, which he often used with us. That's how he spent the whole afternoon. Do you remember if the secretaries were in the apartments at the time? Yes, they were home that afternoon as well, both of them. Do you remember if the Holy Father fell ill that afternoon? No, I did not see this. I knew nothing about this, not even from Sister Vincenza. Sister Vincenza gave testimony that the Holy Father felt ill. He had a pain in his chest and she got a medicine. But you see, even the other sister never heard of this. She's a few feet away. He recited evening prayer. It's, it seems, oh, then she writes this. It seems to me, it seems to me and she's telling this many years later. It seems to me that he did not receive anyone. Perhaps later, Cardinal Fio, she says. Perhaps later, Cardinal Fio. Well, and, 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 and I'm telling you, perhaps later, Cardinal Baggio. Exactly. The Pope recited evening prayer with the two secretaries, and I remember him saying it in English. He's, he's speaking English as he prays evening prayer. Then he went to dinner around 7.30 or 8 p.m. We're getting to the time that you think Baggio came by. The secretaries were present at the dinner, along with Angelo, who was serving as usual, while we sisters were in the other room, as always. Did you see or did you know if John Paul I felt any pain that evening? No, I did not see any particular indication nor any indication from Sister Vincenza or the secretaries. And then, did he retire to his rooms accompanied by his secretaries? So we're getting to the end of the evening. No, he left the way he always did. He didn't need to be accompanied. So she, he's going out of her sight. I remember that evening when dinner was over, after Father Diego handed over the phone call from Cardinal Colombo, so that's confirmed from her. He left the papal apartments. The, the secretary. Mm -hmm. He had gone out in the evening other times before. So the secretary went out, was not there, according to her, on the night that the Pope died. Mm -hmm. However, I don't know where he went. Father McGee, on the other hand, stayed there with us. He stopped by with us nuns to talk a little bit to keep us company. I remember that he had the volume of the papal yearbook with him. Perhaps he had to check something. Now that's an odd detail. The papal, that's the Annuario Pontificio, the big oh, But He's yeah. carrying that around. <laughs> Which is the listing of who works where in the curia, every member of the curia. Who is who and what's what, yes. Yeah. He was leafing through it and began to read the list of popes who they were, how long they had lived, etc. He's reading this. I remember that detail, she says. He stayed with us for maybe half an hour. So she confirms 
that she's around the papal apartments, but she's distant from them with McGee, maybe with the door closed. So she doesn't describe hearing the Pope down the hallway having an argument with anybody. Then he too retired. We usually retired around 10 or 10.30 p.m. Perhaps that evening could have been a little later. Then we come to the morning of the death. What do you remember about that early morning? I got up as usual around 5 a.m. because at 5.30 the groceries we ordered arrived and the flowers were deposited just outside the elevator. That morning I went to collect everything and after I put it all away, I returned to pray with the other sisters. The papal apartments were so small that we could always see each other, even when we were doing different things. We were praying in the little room near the kitchen, all four of us together. Around 5.15 a.m. that morning, like every morning, Sister Vincenza had left a cup of coffee for the Holy Father in the sacristy in front of the chapel just outside the Pope's apartment. When the Holy Father normally came out of his room, he would have some coffee in the sacristy before he entered the chapel to pray. That morning, however, the coffee remained there. About 10 minutes later, Sister Vincenza said, he hasn't come out yet, why not? I was there in the corridor, so I saw that she knocked once, then she knocked again, but he did not answer. There was still silence. Then she opened the door and walked in. I was there as she entered, but I stayed outside. So she's in the doorway. Mm -hmm. I, I heard her say, your holiness, you shouldn't pull these jokes on me. So she's speaking to him. He looks like he's either dozing or uh, still alive, maybe even awake. Then she called out to me. As she came out shocked so i immediately went in and with her and saw him the holy father was in his bed the reading light over the headboard was on he had two pillows under his back that propped him up a bit he was wearing pajamas and in his hands resting on his chest he was clutching some type written pages Mm -hmm. Not the imitation of Christ. Exactly. His head was turned a little bit to the right with a slight smile. His glasses still rested on his nose, and his eyes were just half closed. He really seemed to be sleeping. I touched his hands. Mm -hmm. They were cold. I noticed and was struck by his fingernails, which were a little dark. Mm -hmm. uh, didn't you notice anything out of place? No, nothing, nothing, not even a crease. Nothing fell to the floor. Nothing was disheveled that could suggest there had been any noticeable illness. He looked just like someone who had fallen asleep reading, who fell asleep and stayed that way. Then what did you do? Immediately afterwards, Sister Vincenzo went upstairs to call Father McGee, and I ran to call Father Diego. So the secretary, McGee, was upstairs. They were living on another floor above the Pope in the Apostolic Palace. If you look up, you can see the window where the Pope stands at, and he gives the Urbi et Orbi message or the Sunday Angelus message where everyone comes to see him. You can see little windows above. That's where the secretaries stay above that window. So McGee wouldn't have heard anything. And I ran to call Father Diego. I knocked on his door. I called him, come down, the Holy Father, the Holy Father. He woke with a start and came down. We said a prayer. Then Father McGee went to call the Vatican doctor. Dr. Buzzanetti came almost immediately. I saw Cardinal Vio arrive and then Poletti. So how did Vio know to come and arrive? There's no mention. It's not in this book and somebody else knows that something is going on. 
And uh, what I have to say is that I am deeply appreciative of you and your courage to tell your story. And I think your story is true. However, I don't think we've still got the exhaustive answer. And even you agree that you have a thesis that he died in a uh, reaction of a weak heart to a late evening, late afternoon, late evening encounter with a man who disagreed violently with what he wanted to do, which was to send that man to Venice. I think all of that makes sense. I think uh, the mystery to me is how V.O. heard about it so early and came rushing and why the Pope's fingers, why his fingernails had turned dark. There is no indication of any, any type of creasing in the sheets at all. If you have a heart attack, don't you kind of, don't you kind of, okay, so uh, I'd like to know what Joseph Chilo has, means by this. I'm sorry, that's not what happens when people die of a heart attack. I think I was just trying to say that. What do you think, Father? I don't know. I've had a heart attack, but I didn't die. So I, 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 Did it, was it very quiet and peaceful? Uh, no, <laughs> no, it was not. As a matter of fact, I, I, they took me to the to Gemelli, to the Clinica Gemelli. Oh, and, so, and, and uh, anyway, but that's another story. Yeah, oh, I. I'm yeah, sorry. Well, well, no, but, but sorry, I'm I'm still alive. Don't be sorry. It worked. <laughs> Listen, anyway, that's one book I won't have to buy. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> no, I, I just I just heard it all. I'm just saying. I'm just saying this. Cardinal Baggio had a meeting with the Pope. He was called to that. He went. The, he was upset. He started yelling. He left. The Pope died a matter of hours later. That's what I know, and I know it. I know it because it's what Giovanni Benelli believed, who was going to become his Secretary of State. It's what Cardinal Gagnon believed. It's what Mario Marini believed. Everyone. They were they were they were told this by Benelli had a lot of influence in the Vatican, although he was living in Florence. He was Archbishop of Florence, uh, but he actually put together a great part of the, the, the of the personnel in the Vatican. So did uh, the head of personnel was was Zanoni, was uh, Guglielmo Zanoni. I, right. These okay. these are the people who who I, they're a little bit in the know of what's happening there. And this is, this is this is this is what this is their statement. Um, okay, Benelli, so I, Benelli was Benelli was also uh, insisting with the Pope during those thirty days that he read and study exactly what uh, Gagnon presented him in in the dossier because there had to be changes made in the in the curia. Right, he understood that. He, he confirmed everyone, which, which according to me was not wise, but he did it. And then he was trying to reform the, 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 the Curia, get, cha make changes, which he should have done from day one. From day one, he should have done it, but he didn't. And I think that's, I think that's what cost him his life, directly, indirectly, but it cost him his life. I believe that. I believe well, you. I think this is fascinating. We, we didn't go in full detail through the meeting. On September 25th, Archbishop, then later Cardinal Gagnon, he was Archbishop at the time, I believe, came to you and said, I need to deliver something in the Vatican. Can you drive me? And that too is not, <laughs> that meeting too is not in this book. You went down in your car, you drove Archbishop Gagnon, and he had his papers with him, his dossier. And we, I, drove, I drove Cardinal Gagnon four times to the Vatican. Once to Paul VI, John Paul I, John Paul II, and to hand in his resignation the, next, the, the day after with John Paul II. He right. resigned and left. So there I were four times. I think that you you are a witness to a critically important history. As I mentioned in our previous broadcast, our 
hope is that that dossier can still reemerge. The and dossier, the dossier they have, they have. It's there. Believe me, it's there. Okay. And as you I, know, would love it, I would love it released. I would love it released. Okay. So that is going to be our discussion next time. Your trip with Gagnon on the 25th, when he did meet with John Paul I, and then also your two trips when he met with John Paul II, and then when he resigned and left the Vatican. I think, Bob, also another um, great story to, to tell would be your visit to Cardinal Gagnon on his deathbed in your conversation with him. Well, of course. And that will have to leave for another time yeah, because we are already. Cardinal Mur um, I, well, Monsignor. Mur yes. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I've got to correct you on something. I'm not a Monsignor. Um, My nickname when. Oh, no. On the correction, he freezes. Um, well. So I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us and to make sure that you subscribe and click the bell so you'll be notified of the next live. We don't have a regular schedule on these, and I think that we will perhaps even pop up with an unexpected one for just questions and answers. If you go to InsideTheVatican.com, 30 Years, The Untold Stories, you will find, I put the link in the comments for the different platforms, you will find uh, a, a spreadsheet where you could put your questions in. Um, hopefully Father Murr can hear us even though he can't see us because I wanna share with the two of you a comment that just came in through our email system. And it says, good afternoon. And this is coming from South Wales, UK. I must thank both Dr. Moynihan and Father Charles for their excellent videos and helping to understand the difficulties in the church, the difficulties the church is currently going through. And I completely agree with what Father said in that we need to mature in our faith and certainly not to abandon the church. I hope there will be more of these videos as they really are marvelous. Kind regards, William from South Wales, UK. So, we're getting a lot of feedback, a lot of questions, and in order to help us to look at the questions um, in one place, we've put together a, a spreadsheet for you just to fill in quickly your name. And if you want to rename anonymous, we will keep it anonymous for us to answer your questions when we just do a live stream for questions and answers. So I think that's it for today, Bob. Um, well, I, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And we are just beginning. Uh, we are neophytes. And uh, I think we'll get better as we proceed forward. Yes, I do. And, uh, you know, one thing I do want to mention is that we only have, I think, two seats left for our Easter pilgrimage. Um, we're only taking uh, 12 pilgrims with us on our Easter pilgrimage, which is a wonderful way to prepare for Easter and to spend the Easter Tritium, and of course, the beautiful Easter Sunday and Pasquetta, the little Easter that continues on Easter Monday in Italy. So if you'd like to join us, go to InsideTheVaticanPilgrimages.com for more information. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Deb. Thank you, Father Murr. Thank you, Father.